Welcome to I Had This Patient, hosted by John Scooby Friedman and the Pragmatics. Thanks for tuning in. So we just want to remind everyone that the Pragmatics and their guests, opinions, and thoughts expressed on our show are ours and theirs alone and do not represent their employer or their agency. Follow your state and local protocols. Don't deviate from them. Thanks and enjoy the show. About 2 a.m. the other day, I, I had this patient. Got toned out for uh, chest pain. We get there and it's a 62-year-old male and said he had some indigestion after dinner and tried to lay down and woke up, you know, didn't really fall asleep, but just kind of tried to lay there and he kept getting this like upset, like heartburny feeling. And then it started coming down his left arm, started raiding up to his jaw. And he said, you know, I better call the paramedics. And so we showed up and boy, I tell you, this guy did not look good. He was pale. He was sweaty. He had that look of, I'm ready to meet Jesus, but I'm not ready to meet Jesus. He had the stimmy look. <laughs> he had the bad look, and I had the poopy pants. <laughs> so first things right off the bat, I said, this guy's got chest pain. He looks like shit. Let's get a 12 lead. So I start doing the 12 lead. My partner gets a set of vitals. Sure enough, pops up. He's got an anterolateral stimmy. Cool. You know, we got the ST elevation. We got the positive 12 lead. First thing we're going to do. We're going to shove some aspirin in his mouth. We're going to give him 325 milligrams of baby aspirin, tell him to chew that up. We're going to get moving to a hospital. We're going to call as soon as we can and activate that cath lab because that is the best thing for that patient. But let's say for a second, he didn't have that clear ST elevation. Now, I'm not an EKG expert by any stretch, but there are a couple mimics out there that we all need to know. Uh, Life in the Fast Lane is a great resource for that. Uh, Dr. Smith is another great resource. But bottom line is, we should probably move away from saying STEMI. We should start just saying that patients are having an occlusive MI or they're having what we used to call like a non-STEMI that might be a clot, might not be. It's either an occlusive MI or it's not an occlusive MI. And that's the terminology that I really would like to see us move move towards. You can uh, read more about that in the OMI manifesto. But we digress. We got to get this patient to a cath lab. That's their best chance. Everything else we do is ameliorating the situation but it's not making it any better. It's just kind of taking the edge off those symptoms. So like I said, first thing we're doing is we're giving them aspirin. Aspirin is an antiplatelet drug. It's not really a blood thinner. It's not an anticoagulant like you might think. All it does is it prevents platelet aggregation. It stops those platelets from getting sticky. And so we're doing 325. We're doing the baby aspirin. We're chewing it. So we get that quick absorption because if you give them the enteric coated aspirin, that takes a second. You know, enteric means it doesn't actually absorb until the intestine. And I got that kind of time. Um, one interesting kind of point. I'm sorry? He doesn't have that kind of time. <laughs> no, he does not. One interesting point to keep in mind is that there is a bunch of data out there that shows that we give way too much aspirin, that 162 milligrams is actually perfect, just two pills. And because of that, we're actually putting patients at risk for uh, higher risk for bleeding whether it's a GI bleed or something like that going on later in their hospital course. So AHA still says 325 or 324. My protocol still says 324, but something to keep in mind, you know, maybe something to show your medical director uh, because we found this out in 2007 and we're still doing 324. So go figure. Mm. So at the same time too, this guy, he's pale, he's short of breath, but he's saturating fine, right? His SpO2 is 94% on room air. Am I going to give him oxygen? Absolutely not. Because even though he's short of breath, he's short of breath because he's got an elephant sitting on his chest. And that's the feeling he's got. He's not short of breath because he's hypoxic. And if we add in supplemental oxygen, we can actually make this issue way worse because he's got an area of his heart that's not getting oxygen. That clot is preventing any blood from getting there. So no matter how much oxygen we give him, it's not getting there. And so the idea is this can actually make our, uh, our patients MI worse uh, because what happens is all that oxygen creates a state of hyperoxemia. We get increased free radical production. We get some vasoconstriction. And actually what we found in a study by Dr. Stubb, his co-researchers, was that six months later, patients who were eupoxic, who didn't, weren't hypoxic and got oxygen, had a much bigger uh, infarct size 
than those patients who were uh, not hypoxic and did not get oxygen. So bottom line is correlation doesn't equal causation, but we have a very strong correlation between early unnecessary oxygen and bigger infarct. So what's next? Nitro. A couple things to think about. You have to understand what nitro does before we get into how to give it. So we were all taught, you know, nitro is a vasodilator, right? And so, you know, an EMT school, I thought, oh, vasodilator, you know, we got a clot in the artery, so maybe we can open the artery up a little bit. Nah. Ischemic tissue is going to vasodilate with local hormones as much as physically possible. So that coronary artery that's blocked off is already as wide open as it gets. What we're doing with nitro is we're dropping preload. When we drop preload, we drop the amount of blood coming into the heart. And by doing so, we actually tell the heart like, hey, it's okay to chill out. You can beat a little slower. That also has a side effect of lowering the pressure in the left ventricle. And we know that our coronary perfusion pressure is directly related to our diastolic blood pressure and our uh, left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So you got your systolic di- diastolic, you got your left ventricular and diastolic, the two are hand in hand. But basically when you lower the pressure inside that left ventricle, you can allow more flow through the coronaries and hopefully increase some collateral perfusion because there's less pressure outward. If you think about the coronaries as a bunch of straws running on the surface of a balloon, if you blow, blow that balloon up real big, you're going to put a lot of pressure on those coronaries. But if you let a little air out of that balloon, you can allow a little bit better flow through those straws. So that's the whole goal of nitro is to lower that preload, let the heart work a little easier, and also to maintain that uh, coronary perfusion pressure. So we were all taught, you know, you titrate your nitro to a systolic blood pressure, right? Systolic of 90. But there's some interesting data out there. And actually, uh, special thanks to Tyler from Foam Frat for uh, writing the original post about this. But basically, Dr. Bangalore and his, uh, his researchers found that patients who had a systolic blood pressure of 130, over one, 130 to 140 and a diastolic blood pressure of 80 to 90 had the lowest amount of negative outcomes of any of the STEMI patients. On top of that, anything less than 110 over 70 was strongly correlated with some big issues later on, uh, increased mortality, increased morbidity. Now, so Tyler's figuring at this point, we know that diastolic pressure is probably the most critical number for maintaining good coronary perfusion. So he then extrapolated from that data, we should probably be titrating our nitro, not to a systolic of 90, but to a diastolic of 80 to 90, somewhere in that range because we know that that produces the best outcomes for these patients. However, a lot of y'all have nitro tabs, right? You know, I'm, I'm lucky. I can run a nitro drip. I can dial it in as, as uh, tight as I want. If all you've got is your 0.4 micrograms times three or your 0.4 microgram spray times three, you got to follow your protocol. You got to do the best that you can. But I would still urge you to try to get as close to that 80 number as you can on the diastolic. I wouldn't drop them to 90 like, uh, like we were all taught to do. Uh, and if you do accidentally tank them, yeah, you can add a little fluid and that kind of corrects that preload. However, I would be careful doing this because you have the risk of then adding more work into a heart that's already working pretty hard just to keep going. But let's say you've got your nitro on board. And in this case, we had nitro on board. We were running a nice little drip going. We titrated that blood pressure perfectly to a diastolic of 80 because, you know, the EMS guy just wanted to play nice that night, but he's still hurting. And we know that pain is bad because pain is going to drive up the blood pressure. It's going to drive up the heart rate. And in general, patients that are more relaxed and more comfortable, and this is complete anecdata, this isn't real, but in my general experience, patients that are more relaxed and more comfortable do better because they're not psyching themselves out making their heart work harder, and then causing themselves to crash later on. Coincidentally, if they were to crash, it's a good thing we put those pads on early, right? Every MI, ladies and gentlemen, we should be putting those uh, defibrillator pads on. And to keep your cath lab happy, put them in the AP position. You know, put one on the front, one on the back. Because otherwise, uh, the wires get in the way of the fluoroscopy. They can't see what they're doing, and they have to replace them. On the same note, you should be doing your IV on the left side because they need that right side for the cath. But regardless, say your patient's still having pain. We know that pain is tissue lost. In the past, we used morphine, right? Great drug. Pre- decreases the preload and makes the patient real happy. Yeah, well, it turns out that 
and there's some question as to how clinically relevant this is, that morphine will actually interfere with the P2Y12 inhibitors. So your Brylintas, your Ticagrelors, all those drugs that we're going to use as like super aspirins. There's some suggestion that this is probably completely irrelevant clinically, but morphine has so many other issues associated with it. I use fentanyl. Every time I'll start, you know, 50 to 100 mics and titrate that to the patient's, uh, patient's comfort level. And hopefully we can get rid of some of that crushing pain. And hopefully uh, between the nitro and the fentanyl, we can keep the patient comfortable. Do we want to take all their pain away? Probably not. They still need to be able to tell us if something changes. We're not using morphine and we're certainly not using ketamine. When I went to medic school before you guys, mono was actually a thing and oxygen was legitimately a thing. But they taught us that nitro was, so, I mean, we learned about the pharmacological aspects of it, but also was given for pain management. How how much is that actually supported by data, right? Like if I have angina, you get it. I can't give you a solid data-driven answer to that, but from a physiological standpoint, the way nitro reduces pain and, you know, provides a little analgesia is by slowing that workload of the heart. And therefore we, uh, like we were talking about earlier, we're lessening the workload and we're increasing uh, coronary perfusion. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, we're decreasing oxygen consumption and hopefully slightly upping uh, the oxygen that's actually getting to the infarcting area. And so that's what's actually causing that analgesic effect. It's okay. not a direct analgesic in that it eliminates pain. It's eliminating the source of the pain. So the old the old thing was this, right? The old thing was you, you got a patient with chest pain, doesn't matter what kind of chest pain, it's like chest pain, you always give aspirin and oxygen, right? Mm-hmm. And then nitro. You start a line and then you give nitro. Yep. And then the, the idea was to give the nitro until the pain was gone. That was mm-hmm. the old saying. Mm-hmm. So in reality, we've kind of moved away from that. Am I, is that what I'm Absolutely. catching on to? Okay. I don't mean to be glib or whatever, but you can absolutely kill people that way. Nitro is not a benign drug. And especially once you start getting, you know, because when you figure you're doing the sprays, right? And that's a cumulative dose at that point, because the half-life is not quite as long or quite as uh, short as the redose. So basically when you're doing that spray, that equates to roughly a 50 microgram, uh, microgram per minute drip, which I'll do all the time on, uh, with an IV bottle. But doing that with an imprecise, poorly controlled uh, spray bottle can be very dangerous. You can actually get into uh, some pretty serious arterial dilation and dropping blood pressure to fatal points. Okay. Why wouldn't you not consider ketamine? At the pain control dose from from 0.1 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, especially if uh, you're going to have to say your patient went into VTAC, which is quite common in STEMI patients. Yeah, Um, I I hear you know something about that. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I'm very hesitant on giving that patient Versed uh, that's having an infarct. So they're going to remember my my name for the probably the rest of their life when I (laughs) give them some Edison medicine. So, but why not consider ketamine when instead of doing the opposite of what Versed does, which is possibly tank that already low BP, especially if they're hanging out 90 systolic, mm-hmm. why not consider ketamine if you have the option to do it? So for procedural mm-hmm. sedation, that's a, a slightly different thought is that's pretty quick in out versus a continuous pain dose. Right. But besides that, and this is actually, uh, I, I am ashamed to admit this, but I'm actually leaning towards, uh, in the future, if I do have to cardiovert these patients, I'm leaning towards using Atomidate because there is some really fantastic data that just came out about RSI in medical patients, including sepsis, including all those things that we thought Atomidate was trashed for. Uh, patients that received ketamine during RSI versus Atomidate tanked so much harder. And I was talking to Dr. Schauer, who's the author of the, one of the authors, I should say, of the study. It's him and Mike April and a couple other brilliant folks. Uh, and Doc Schauer's take on it is that ketamine, we know ketamine causes some left ventricular dysfunction. We also know that it causes some indirect catecholamine release. So it probably balances out until you have that sick patient who is already experiencing some pretty serious catecholamine action. 
And then you took away that left ventricular drive with no extra catecholamine boost. So to answer your question, that's why I'm not using ketamine for pain control. Also the fact that it is a sympathomimetic. We're speeding up the heart rate when we give it, even at pain control doses, which for your trauma patient, not a big deal. For your sick heart, big deal. Uh, and then when we're talking about procedural sedation, I'm probably leaning towards Atomidate or Versed and more likely Atomidate due to its hemodynamics. Yeah, I can dig it. So, Sweet. so in summary, it's no longer Mona, it's Fona. And that, oh, unless the patient has a SpO2 of 90 or less, we're not going to give oxygen, correct? Absolutely. You okay. know, if I could boil it down to, you know, the, the key summary, early activation and recognition, because you can't activate without recognition. Right. I'm going to start over and you'll edit that part out. We're going to talk about early recognition and activation. Aspirin. Aspirin. If they are hypoxic and only if, start at the lowest flow oxygen possible. I'll even start at two liters nasal cannula. Then our nitro. And if nitro doesn't control the, uh, their pain level past the diastolic of 80, then fentanyl. Adds on every patient. Always. And... And when you say hypoxic, you mean ninety and below. That's going to come down to your uh, come down to your individual protocol. Okay. I'm not going to step in and play medical director. Copy. But if they've got blue lips and they're breathing hard and they don't look good, and that SAT says 91 versus 92, 93, you know, I would start considering it. Um, definitely below 90, and then it's going to come down to individual preference for anything less than 94. Okay. What are your thoughts I, on nitro in uh, inferior STEMIs? Oh, <laughs> gosh. Well, as soon as you let me talk about POCUS, we'll talk about it. So, yeah, we can, have, we can have – I mean, I think that's a conversation. I mean, I – oh, God. Real quick thoughts. We can all, we can all give I mean, our yeah, quick thoughts. I'm not going to say no or yes because it's hard to determine whether or not the patient needs it. So – I look at a whole multitude of things before I even suggest giving nitro to an inferior MI. Mm -hmm. But going back one step, I am a little, and this may be just my, my style. If the patient comes to you and says, I have chest pain and you haven't brought because you're lazy and you didn't bring your, your monitor with you. Right. We'll just say hypothetically, mm -hmm. do you not give aspirin before you do the 12 lead? Yeah, you can. I do. What about Scoopy? I think there's nothing wrong with, you know, mm -hmm. doing, you could even half dose it if you're feeling uncomfortable. You know, you could use that 162 because we know that's effective. I'll just ask if they have any bleeding disorders or yeah, any uh, gastro history of GI bleeds. And if they okay. say no, or, or obviously an allergy to aspirin. Yeah, I'll just give it anaphylaxis. I'll, um, I'll give it, I'll give it to him like you just mentioned Aaron. So what about, what about this? Cause this is common, right? At least in, in where both Scooby and I have worked in these big urban environments. Well, I already took my aspirin and I already took my nitro. So to me, anyway, I know this is not, know, this is not research driven. This is just more like, you know, Hey, situation. can you show me the bottle? How many okay. of these did you take? Cool. If they've already taken 325 and it's been, you know, an hour, fine. Leave it. Right. If dispatch told them to do it, in directions while we were headed there and they took coated aspirin, I'm going to give them another 324. I'd say you're probably within your right to do so. Um, I personally don't because by the time I get there, you know, I'm looking at 20, 30 minutes of arrival time. Odds are it's already hit the intestine. We're good. If they've, you know, if they've already taken their nitro, cool. You know, we'll reassess and we'll give more because right. I don't really, uh, after I have an IV. Cause yeah, I, exactly. Cause I'm with, I'm with, I'm, I'm of the opinion of Aaron. You can't say I'll never give a patient this drug because all patients are different. So I'm well, like Aaron. I will take the whole picture of the patient into account and if they're having an inferior STEMI. But, I mean, even in septal anterior STEMIs, lateral STEMIs, they can still have crap blood pressures. Mm -hmm. But I always before I give nitro, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll always have at least a line. large bore IV. Mm-hmm. And yeah, bag, I mean, I'm starting. Hanging. I'm starting an 18 if I can, um, but and in these patients every two. time. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm going to blow y'all's minds real quick. 
There was a study done in uh, the last couple of years that showed that basically they examined a BLS system giving nitro. And it found that patients were pretty much going to become hypotensive or not, uh, whether they had an inferior STEMI, uh, you know, basically of all the inferior STEMIs, 50% that got nitro became hypotensive. So I looked at that data. I said, you know, it makes sense. You f- consider the, the distribution of STEMIs, how many of those were right side involvement? And that's, we're probably getting a little in the, in the weeds for this one, but just a cut and dried inferior STEMI that has all the signs of needing some preload reduction. They've got JVD or, you know, you get on the POCUS and you take a look at their heart and their right ventricle is huge and isn't working real well, but they don't have right side extension of that MI. Sure. I think nitro is a completely valid, uh, completely valid treatment regimen. When you get into the right ventricular infarction, that's when it gets sticky. And I've heard very convincing arguments each way. You know, I was taught, I was from the days of your patients with the RVI got a liter of fluid and then they got another liter of fluid. They maybe another liter of fluid for good measure. Wonderful. And it wasn't until I had been through critical care, had my flight medic license. I was talking to my boss one day about this and it was actually in the interview for that job that I'm at now. And he said, well, tell me how you treat a right ventricular infarction. I said, oh, simple, you know, 16 gauge IV and dump a liter of fluid in. I'll dump another liter of fluid. In. I'll give him some aspirin. I'll dump another liter of fluid in. And he said, cool. So you're, you're going to kill them. I was like, excuse me? He said, well, think about it. Patient with an RVI is in right heart failure. It's already not pumping. And so at what point are you, do you think that like pouring more fluid in is fixing that? They're in failure. And I said, well, you know, Frank Starling, I was told Frank Starling. And he said, yeah, but Frank Starling's a curve. And past a certain point on that curve, you're making it worse by adding more preload. And they're already long past that point. That heart ain't working. And so what's the answer then? Are we going to do an inotrope? Are we going to do a little push dose epi? I don't know. I really don't. That is one situation that I've not come across. And the day that I do, I will be getting on the phone with the first cardiologist that takes my call. Well, you didn't cover one thing and maybe we're going to get into the weeds just a hair here, but let's, let's just ask the question. And then if we need a follow up, we can do it again. What about a beta blocker? Mm. Mm. So that's actually uh, something that you don't see a whole lot of in EMS for sure. Uh, I have it in protocol for my patients that are, you know, refractorily tachycardic and hypertensive to the nitro, to the fentanyl, to all these things. You know, we have metoprolol. Yeah. And in all honesty, I have never had any opportunity to give it. So I can't speak too knowledgeably on, uh, on how it's worked in my personal experience, but it is an option that's out there, um, that some folks have, have in formulary. Yeah. So what was it? Mona bath was, yeah, uh, something like that. So EMS dosing typically won't cause arterial vaso- uh, vasodilation until you start getting to the very upper limit. Right. Uh, that's why you hear the old, you know, the old tale of back in the day when we, we had CHFers, we'd throw, you know, four nitro tabs in their face and then put the CPAP mask on real quick. So we yeah. have a question from the, uh, I had this patient. Facebook shout, it, shout him out, dude. Shout out. Big I Tim. will. Big Tim. Big Tim McAllister asked, and we, we sort of discussed this question a little bit pre-show. Mm-hmm. He asked if uh, you're on an EMT truck and mm-hmm. you have a, STEMI patient or what you believe to be a OMI patient. Is there anything that they can do in order to make the cath lab activate faster? Me and Aaron came to agreement. I don't think there is, but you may have some more resources bedside. What are your thoughts, Scooby? So, you know, first of all, shout out Tim for uh, calling in. That's awesome. A couple of things to consider. Even as a medic, you know, a critical care medic with all the fancy letters after my name, I saw docs tell me, no, I'm not accepting your activation. I don't think there's anything you can do that's going to make a hospital activate. You can declare a code STEMI. You can say this. You can give them the EKG. And they're still going to say, "Eh, well, the cardiologist is on the back nine right now, so I don't want to piss him off. So on the other hand, though, as an EMT, you don't have an EKG a lot of the time. You're having to rely on that physical assessment. And so what are the things we're looking for? You know, the patient I had was just the perfect image of LLS, right? Looks like shit. 
but not every patient's that way, right? We have patients that have abnormal presentations. Our old ladies, our middle-aged ladies will have abdominal pain. They'll have nausea. They'll have anything but cut and dried chest pain. Our diabetics will have the same weird kind of presentation due to the neuropathies. Right, right. They'll have numbness or tingling or, you know, something strange like that. And so that's why we always have to be tuned in doing our full assessment and knowing these things that like to trick us. You know, Dr. Osler, the, the famous internal medicine doc said, and I'm going to paraphrase here, the patient will always tell you what's wrong with them. You just have to listen. Mm-hmm. And these patients are no different. They may have these funky presentations, but they're telling you. You just have to know how to listen. Right. So, Tim, in all my years of experience, my only suggestion would be to paint a glorious picture for them. For whatever reason you feel like your patient is having some sort of cardiac event that you can't explain, and they've told you they have chest pain, and you're looking at all the signs that Scooby discussed at the very beginning, and you can paint that picture for the ED, your chances of getting that cath lab activated sooner are more likely. Probably not going to happen, but at least you've painted a picture and given them the ability to make a better decision because where they go in the ED is determined on your report. So consider that information um, when you pick up a patient. Are you going to activate the cath lab? Probably not, but you can paint a big beautiful picture like a Mona Lisa and that gives them a better idea of who you're bringing in. Did you say Mona Lisa on purpose? Did did you like that? (laughs) That was my pun for the night. A phone Lisa. And I'll second Aaron and Scooby's. (laughs) I mean, how how many times have we all as paramedics had a 12 lead and for whatever reason it didn't transmit because the cell phone sucked or the wireless router, uh, was was out on the fritz and you call a code stimmy because you can see it on your monitor but you still don't even go to the cath lab you get shucked into the ed first so that Mm -hmm. ed doc can verify the stimmy so it's not just emt basics it's medics i mean we can paint the most glorious mona lisa phone lisa phone lisa possible (laughs) but Sorry. For the most part, I firmly believe that if most doctors don't see that EKG, they're not going to activate the cath lab. It means a debate that's going to go on forever. And it depends on where you work in the hospital and your relationship with the with the physician that's there. I mean, there's a whole bunch of factors. That Shoot, your relationship with the nurse who's taking report. Yeah. You know, so, if that nurse knows, oh, yeah, that's that's, that's Sammy, Jason. Tim. Jason bringing in that patient, He, you know, he... He, he knows what he's doing or he, no, he's a dumbass <laughs> or he's a dumbass. So no, we're not going to have activate the cath lab and we're going to put him in triage. Cause that's probably where they belong versus, right. you know, like, Oh man, I know Aaron and he's squared away and he's a quality medic. There's a lot of, <laughs> I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> there are a lot of moving pieces within, uh, the activation of a, a stimuli. Yeah. So. It's a good, it's a good question. Tim. Good question. I think, uh, I think, uh, we tried to answer it the best we could. Um, and it happens to medics too. It's not just basic. So oh, right. it happens to doctors. Hell, have, yeah, no, I mean, true. Yeah, the amount of ER physicians uh, that miss calls, and you know that's okay because doctors but, aren't infallible. We're not infallible. Right. Well, there's a book uh, a tool go on to one day. There's a story that he talks about where one of the greatest twelve lead readers in, of our time matched a machine. And even he was beaten by the machine and they read like some extraordinary 12,000, 12 leads and the machine beat him pretty major. To be fair, who's saying the machine was right? Because my life pack thinks that everyone's having a st- I mean, I can't <laughs> quote, but there was some, they, what they basically did was they took all of these 12 leads that were actual 12 leads that were STEMIs and, mm-hmm. or whatever we're calling them. And they put them into the machine and compared them to the ones that they were reading. Uh, obviously. It's not, it's not perfect. Point of it, the point of it was people make mistakes and people miss STEMIs or OMIs all the time. I just look forward to the day that my medical director is replaced by artificial intelligence because that's, that's where it's going, right? Watch Social Peter's- Dilemma, dude. <laughs> I'll just watch it last night. Did you? It's good. Yeah, we shouldn't talk good. about it, though. Let's, let's just let the people watch it. Watch it's, it. It's, it's, it's interesting. 
I took the CPR app off my phone after that because I'm afraid they're going to just start watching me do CPR wrong. I'm not trying to get in trouble for that. And again, thanks for writing in, Tim. And yep. other people should start writing in. But uh, let's throw out some to- three topics for next month. Okay, trauma. Trauma. What type of trauma? I don't care. I just want to throw it out there because I like throwing it out there. But we shouldn't talk trauma. trauma. We should talk As a matter of fact, I did have a great hemorrhage call the other day. No, let's do the varices. Let's do varices. Yeah. We'll do a soft, we'll put it out there. Esophageal varices. I got a paper on it if you want it. You can have it. I'll I'll, I'll send it to you. Esophageal varices. Triple A's. Triple A, yeah. Triple A's. Not the baseball team. (laughs) And finally, overdoses yeah but i can not, talk some overdoses but let's not do let's not do opiate overdoses it's like all of my experience yeah oh, no that's it's like my first it year as a medic that's all yeah. i did beta blocker overdoses okay mm. yeah there we go all right all right so Thanks we're gonna put those you. three up everyone listening in the i had this patient chat we're gonna put it up as a poll get on there vote and uh We'll talk about whatever you guys vote on. Scooby, you got Sounds anything good. else? No, nah, guys. It's- Thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, we'll be back in a couple of days with another episode. Thanks for listening. And thanks for supporting our supporters and sponsors. Let's give a shout out to Priority One Air Rescue, Red Clover Coffee Company, Black Wolf Helicopters, Say Again Over Patch Company, and the Do It For Drew Foundation. We look forward to having you next episode.